Okay, um, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the uh, Community Board 3 Health Seniors Human Services Youth Education and Human Rights Committee meeting. This is our monthly meeting. Um, this is the first time we're doing a virtual meeting. Uh, we haven't met since March, actually. So it's, you know, a, a first for us. Okay, um, the meeting, just want to let you know that the meeting is being recorded. Um, and the recording will be on the website. Um, you'll be able to find the link to it somewhere at the, uh, the home page. I think it's on the right hand side. Yeah. Um, today, okay, so for today's meeting, I just want to let you know that um, when Larissa finds the instructions, um, she'll be giving an introduction to how the CB3 meetings are run um, virtually. You know, it's a little different, um, uh, in some ways different, some ways similar to the in-person meetings that you probably have been to. Okay, I have those made whenever you're ready, sorry. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. um, and also I wanted to recognize, I'll do it more later, but we do have some new community board members who are visiting our committee today. Um, they just got appointed a little while ago, about a month or two ago, and they're checking us out to see if they would like to join us. Okay, so, um, and also another thing is that uh, Thomas, uh, Larissa is our secretary in normal times, but um, since Larissa has um, another job right now um, at this meeting, Thomas will be taking over as secretary and he will be taking the minutes. Great, thanks Thomas. No problem. Okay, so Larissa, okay. can you um, just give the... Uh... Sure. Uh, welcome and thank you for attending. Here are a few guidelines for tonight's meeting. This meeting is being recorded. If you are not a committee member, please sign in by entering your name and affiliation and any item you wish to speak on in the chat box. Please stay muted unless you are speaking. On the desktop computer, if you're using a desktop to log into the meeting, you want to unmute using the microphone button at the bottom left of your screen or press the space bar to temporarily unmute yourself. If you're calling in via phone, you can tap the mute icon at the bottom of your screen on your phone. If you would wish to speak, please raise your hand. You can raise your virtual hand or you can raise your hand physically. I'll, take, I'll be watching the gallery. Um, on your desktop computer, you can click participants at the bottom of your screen, go to the bottom of the list, and click the button labeled raise your hand. On the phone, if you're calling in, if you press the star nine, you will raise your hand virtually. Um, after each presentation, the chair will take comments and questions from board members first, then the public will have a chance to speak. Uh, you will have a two minute time limit. The committee will then formulate and pass resolutions if there are any to go over tonight. Um, if you want to mute your audio, uh, you can do so again by using the, um, the microphone button at the bottom left hand of your screen. If you want to, and does anyone need to know how to use the chat box? Okay. All right. May, go ahead. Okay. Um, so, okay, so I wanted to, I'm sorry, I wanted to, I just have to call something. Okay, I wanted to, okay, so before we start the meeting, I wanted to recognize that we have uh, four new community board members here today. Can you introduce yourselves? I think there's three or four. Troy? Troy Bledis, a uh, long-time member of, um, well, member of CB3, a uh, public member last year, a uh, long-time resident of Louisa. Okay, Ricky? Ricky? Sorry, can you guys hear me? Yes. Wow. I'm sorry, yeah, I'm having some difficulties with my laptop, I think problems with the video, but um, Ricky Wong, uh, born and raised uh, Lower East Side Chinatown, uh, formerly with the New York City Department of Health, formerly with the New York City Department of Consumer Affairs as well too, now in private sector. 
Wendy. Hi, uh, it's my first time here, just got appointed. I was born and raised in Chinatown, right here in Lower East Side, Manhattan, and I currently am working at Cornell Hospital in the neurology department. Uh, Andrea, thank you. Andrea. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Andrea Gordillo. I am a longtime resident of 7th Street. Um, I am a, a cultural producer and um, a development consultant for community-based organizations in NCB3. Uh, primarily Latino um, and Puerto Rican ones. And I'm happy to be here. Thank you all. Okay, thank you, Andrea. All right, so we will um, go to our first agenda item, uh, which is to vote on the, the minutes of the uh, previous meeting, which was in March. Okay, so all of the community board members should have received the minutes. Uh, you received it back in March and you received it again last week. Uh, we will have a roll call vote on the minutes. Uh, uh, Thomas, you can start. Okay. Calling out the names and then people just say uh, present or abstaining. Okay, here's our roll call, May Lee. Uh, yes. Okay. Deborah? Yes. Larissa? Yes. Is David here yet? Eric? Mm -hmm. Shirley? Tatiana? Yes. Paul? Yes. Thomas is yes. Heidi? Yes. And Carmen Perez? Yes. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, okay, so now we're, we're, um, we're, okay, so now we're gonna go on to our second agenda item, which is our district need statement. Um, this year we're going to, I think, talk about you know, combine the district needs and the budget priorities a bit. Uh, but before we go on, um, continue, Susan, could you just give an introduction to what the district needs statement is and what our goal is? Yeah, I'll, I'll give a, a very short um, overview and apologies to everyone who heard it last night. Um, the beginning of the budget process for community boards starts in May with the writing of the district needs statement. We're working on the following fiscal year starting in July, 2021. The district needs statement describes our community. It's geographic, demographic, socioeconomic, um, any way we can think of. We, and we um, note the existing conditions and the needs that arise from these conditions. An example might be the number of seniors living in poverty. And we document everything, give statistics, and then this can lead to needs such as local and affordable geriatric care, more meal slots in senior centers, more NORCs, um, that's, that sort of programs and um, needs. We assess our needs with a focus on the unmet, unmet needs or problems, and we can recommend projects or activities to meet these needs. They may be short-term solutions or longer term or the community board might not have a recommendation to solve the problem. Um, and not every problem can be solved by funding a project. Um, we do not ask to fund programs or priorities in the statement. The district needs statement informs the budget priorities. And then in October, we will vote on specific budget priorities. Um, in this statement, each committee should give an introductory overview for areas in their jurisdiction. And um, the one thing we need to be careful of is not to get into a policy document. Um, it should be the needs of our specific district and all information should be documented. Um, our statement is used by a lot of people. Um, if you look at Lower East Side Employment Network, a lot of their promotional material um, is taken right from our district needs um, organizations giving grants refer to our district needs. 
hospitals writing their district needs statement refer to our district needs. We'll be working on this through August and we'll vote on it in October. And usually we vote earlier, but since um, information is changing so rapidly right now, um, this will allow time for us to finalize it, but then add new information if necessary. After the district needs, we'll be meeting with agencies. The committee leadership meets with agencies in September. Uh, for this committee, we meet with um, uh, uh, ACS Children, uh, Department of Education, HRA, DHS, DYCD, and discuss specific programs that will fit our needs. Um, and then in October, all the committees will vote on their priorities and then the full board will um, uh, collate them and vote on the priorities for the board. Um, all this is separate from participatory budgeting, which is a new invention and really has nothing to do with boards. And that's about it. Um, is there any questions or a number of people here know a lot about this, like Wendy and Ricky, who've worked on it from the other end. So has anyone think I'm missing something or want to ask a question? No? Great. Yeah. So, you know, um, just about participatory budgeting, that, that's um, city council discretionary money. Mm -hmm. um, or it's, it's uh, so, but the district needs what we're talking about is a different pot of money and it's the uh, larger, you know, when you hear that, you know, that, um, oh, the mayor and the city council, you know, signed on an bu annual budget. That's the budget we're talking about. Um, yeah. So it's the like the, sort of the meat uh, of um, you know uh, the budget. Right. Um, if I could just yeah. add a capital and expense uh, budget for each agency. Right. Yeah. So um, so committee members, you know, this year, you know, every year, you, you know, for those of you who have been on this committee last year and were part of the um, process to formulate the district needs, you know, you know what we did. We looked at the needs and and what we want and, and we, uh, you know, made, uh, made it, wrote a document. So this year, as you know, everything is very different. And rather than looking at what's being cut or what's being needed, I think our overriding question is, well, for 21-22, what do we need in light of everything that's happening now? Is there something new? Uh, or perhaps there is something that's always been pressing but now, in light of what is happening now and what is, you know, how we will reopen and go into the future, um, we may consider that those needs are even more pressing and even need to be um, highlighted more. So there's two different documents, the needs and the budget priorities, but they go hand in hand. So, um, so this year, what I would like to do is, um, you know, we, we, we have some time to decide on, to finalize our budget priorities and district needs. As Susan said, we can vote on both in October, all at the same time, which, which would benefit us because as you know, things are changing constantly. I mean, things last two weeks ago and today are already very different, you know, even though there's COVID-19. Um, so we could use the extra time uh, I do want to bring in more speakers to help us uh, decide our, you know, what our district needs to be, should be. So they would be people who are working on the ground and, um, and not just uh, who could also have a, give us an overview of what they think, you know, we need to do, you know, in two years. Uh, not this coming year, not this coming month, uh, but, you know, in 21, 22. Um, so we need their input to design our, and that, that's what our district needs statement is really about. It's what, you know, the people are telling us, or in this case, you know, people who are working in the community. Are there any questions? No? You, you would have to unmute yourself if you have a question. Okay, so, um, so we have two speakers today. We have uh, Naomi Pena from hey, community. I just have one question. Yes. Um, moving forward since, I mean, for the past three months has been such huge changes. Uh, I know that I've been getting them from DIFTA uh, with regards to changes in programming. 
Um, looking forward into this next budget, because um, again, there's no guarantee of any kind of vaccine and, and the changes already being made to certain programs. Um, was there any type of uh, directive given as to how we should look forward to this next budget year? We've already voted on the coming budget year. We're looking at July a year from now. All right, I'm just saying, you know, in case anything doesn't change. Well, this budget's gonna be finalized at the, the current budget for next month will be finalized by the end of this month. And we have written letters, like we wrote a letter to protest the cuts in um, summer youth employment program. Right. Okay. Right. So if you are, I mean, it, it, the end of June is coming very soon. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Uh, but what we had done is that if we were aware of any cuts to programs that we that were part of our, part of our budget priorities, you know, uh, that we had already voted on last year, so we would we we just wrote a letter to say protest it because we had voted to have it. So we are really looking at 21, 22. But I think that what happens this, as you know, what happens this year in 2021 will impact what we need in 21, 22. Yes? All right. I think you know what I mean, right? So um, did you have a specific question about some events in 2021? Or, no. or budget no. items in 2021? Hmm. Budget that, items, right? That that yeah, yeah that that's my my concern with the budget items, especially with certain services for uh, for seniors, since most of them have been pretty much on lockdown. Um, <clears throat> you know, hopefully, uh, as the city begins to open again, we'll see how that works out. Oh, okay. Uh, but um, but whatever they need, it's definitely going to continue into the following following year. Is that correct? Or even could be even, there could be even more. I would say more. Okay. At so, this rate. Okay. Good. Okay. So I know that you, you, since you work at Cooper Square and you're with the NORC, I know you have a, yeah, we, so we need, so on this committee, we have members who work um, for different agent, different uh, human service agencies or community um, service agencies who can directly provide us with the expertise. So I thank Carmen for the seniors um, and DIFTA. You know, we definitely need your help. Um, but we're also going to bring in speakers who can give us more information beyond what we have. So we expand our knowledge. So today we have um, Naomi Pena, who's from the um, CEC1. It's just you, right, Naomi, here? I don't see Lila. Yeah. OK. So Naomi, Naomi will discuss um, the needs of the public school students and what they see for 20, or 21, 22. And then Carlin, Co is your last name Cohen or Cowan? Cohen. Okay, Carlin Cohen is from the Chinese American Planning Council and she will um, discuss uh, something called the Asian uh, Neighborhood Recovery Plan, which is a um, plan that's signed on by many Asian American organizations, including I think 11 who are from our area and also the settlement houses in our area. So, uh, so and I think some of those um, items she'll discuss are applicable to the other communities. And just to let you know, we do plan to meet in July. Uh, committee members, we plan to meet in July. We can also meet in August and we can invite more speakers at each meeting. Susan, do we have time in September as well? Um, it's kind of late, right? Well, th so this is in September, you're gonna be dealing with the budget priorities and I don't see how you could possibly do both at once. Okay, okay, so we have July and August. Right. Okay, very good. Uh, Naomi, would you like to speak first? Sure. Um, hi everyone. Have a, I hope everyone's having a good evening. My name is Naomi Pena. I am born and raised in the Lower East Side. Even more fortunate that I can raise my four kids in the Lower East Side and I am CEC1 president. 
Um, thank you for having me. I know um, you guys are working on your district needs and I'm always grateful that you guys, uh, you know, ask for input. Um, I think we can all agree that um, the events as of March have been, um, you know, um, for lack of a better term, I think um, a lot. <laughs> um, I think even the events that are happening across this country um, in the last week has been um, an emotional toll. I know it's, it's taken an emotional toll in my, for myself and my household. But um, one of the glaring things that I am seeing that we need is, as you all know, um, whenever there's a budget crisis in the city, the first thing that always gets cut is education. Even though um, we still expect our kids to you know, excel and do well, and, but we always cut them first and then we wander, wonder why they're not doing as great. But um, everything has been cut. I believe the last total was around uh, $700 million in cuts. I could be wrong. I don't know what the, the next total has been. Um, all supportive services have been cut for kids. So um, those programs that usually support children after school all have been cut. So Beacons, Sonics, um, after school services, all have disappeared. They're not being funded. And so it's opening um, a very, it's, this can potentially open a, a very bad Pandora's box for our children because they don't have anything to do over the summer. Obviously this is not for now, it's projecting in the future, but even after school and parents have to work, you know, what do we expect our kids to do? They're not gonna stay in the school building to three o'clock and go straight home. That's not just what kids do. So there's a call that um, we need to start having a lot of discussion around social emotional support. Um, this has taken a toll on many families. You know, there's kids have been stuck inside for, you know, since March. They have dealing, they've been dealing directly or indirectly with loss from COVID-19. Um, there's a lot of questions that are being asked, you know, during COVID-19 and even now. Um, there's a lot of discussions I'm hearing across this district about, you know, being racial allies and, and acknowledging what's going on. Um, and a lot of this is really emotional. A lot of this is, is um, taking a toll on kids. And, you know, if, if you live in a neighborhood, you know, we've been living with helicopters from sundown to sunset which makes sleeping near to impossible. It's been near to impossible in my own home anyway be during COVID. Um, you know, my view is a seven precinct. So my kids now see a, a direct perimeter around the seven precinct that's completely blocked off with, you know, police and, and armor gear. That's all very scary for these kids. Um, and I think not addressing this is gonna, it's going to have an impact on our children and it's going to show directly in the classroom. And we cannot expect our kids to show up to school in September. If they do show up to school in September, if we're back to normal, whatever that normal is, and not miss a step and think like they're off to the races and they're going to pretend like everything has been okay since then. So I think not addressing that is a huge hurdle. We, as you all aware, there is a, larger ratio of school security officers to uh, guidance counselors. I think it's, we only have like a, a few hundred, if, if that, in the entire school system, um, which means not every single building has a guidance counselor. Um, and if they do, it's often related, it's connected to our CBO partners, if it's a community school. So the Henry Streets Education Alliance, um, those folks are providing supported services to our kids, but it's not through the DOE. So I think that's something that should be top of mind because the social emotional supports that our kids are gonna need, 
after this is going to be unsurmountable. And a lot of things are going to come up from this that if we don't address it, it's going to spill over. Thank you. Okay. Um, so committee members, uh, do you have, okay, this will do some Q&A. Committee members, do you have any questions? Please raise your hand and I will call on you. Uh, nobody has questions? No, Thomas is raising his hand. Oh, okay. Thomas. Yeah. Um, in addition to the, the loss of after school programming and uh, deficiency with counselors, do you anticipate also another loss of SYEP for the next summer or two? I, I suspect if, if, if the city does not create, or the state does not create another form of revenue, they will continue to cut every single youth program in this city because they're not going to deem it to be essential. Um, I know the city council has made some commitments that they want to figure something out. I don't know what that looks like. I don't, you know, I can't tell, but I think funding SYEP literally is, is, is the biggest, is one of the many insults, not the biggest, but one of the many insults of the budget cut. Because SYEP is one of the um, first jobs that many of our low income students actually experience in their life. That's what helps build their resume. And they often use that money to help their family or buy their back to school supplies. So that way they're not a burden on the rest of the household. Um, so the fact that that got cut um, has created a huge uproar. Um, I don't see it. If the mayor, you know, the fact that the mayor cut it immediately, it tells me that he doesn't think it's a priority, which we all can disagree that it, it, with that. But um, the fact that he was willing to cut it so quickly is also an indication that he's going to continue to cut it if he needs to. Okay. Um, Susan, Heidi, and then Paul. Okay, uh, so before these times, we had uh, still had very specific needs we're aware of and that we had started prioritizing, um, such as children um, with special needs um, in the schools. So given the conditions you're talking about, when we write our um, district need statement and we have to focus and uh, articulating a few needs. And then we will be looking at funding um, as one of the ways to deal with those. Could you like give a few specific needs if you had to pull out a few to be on top? And they would be, you know, needs to deal with the kinds of problems that you've been mentioning. The first thing I will say is social workers. I think that's critical in my personal opinion. I think we need social workers in every single school community period. Um, two, um, I, would, I would then, this is where I think it's, it's a little sort of cross, Cross pollination with the because I, I do believe that students in, with special needs are also suffering tremendously, if not double the amount of, of trauma, because um, there's a wide range of supports, there's a wide range of services that children with special needs receive, because there's also a wide range of, of special needs. And, and their expectations. So, you know, you could go from like someone who's, you know, autistic, but high functioning to very severe. And, you know, a lot of these students, for instance, for students with autism, if they're severe autism, this, they're not doing well in these circumstances. This is breaking their routine. They do well, really well with routine. They not in the school building, they're with people they don't know. Um, they don't understand why they can't be with people. And a lot of the families are experiencing um, the child rebelling or like acting out and because they don't know, they're very confused by all of this. So I think um, 
this is a little bit why, again, to reinforce why the needs of, uh, why we need social workers, um, because they can do really well with students like that, and they can, they have the ability to reach them. Um, I think that would be my top number one. Top number two, I think number two would be um, supportive services, like through after school programs and the Beacons and the Sonics and the YAs, SYAPs. Um, because that is a support to families that also doubles up as supports for, for, for the students as well. Because through those programs, those partners are also keeping tabs on families and they have um, the ability to provide the related services if they need specialized related services, you know, through counseling or, um, or sometimes those staff workers become, you know, a pseudo mentor to these kids that they create relationships with. So and those would be my top number two. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Heidi, did you put your hand down? Does that mean you changed your mind? It well. didn't change my mind. Susan asked my question. I was going to ask for specific recommendations. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, Paul. Hi. Uh, hi, Naomi. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, question about technological needs for our young people throughout the district. Um, I know personally as an academic coordinator, my students have had trouble accessing technology and I'm thinking schools, the DOE, private schools, doesn't matter. All education programs are going to go eventually into a hybrid form of learning at some yeah. point, whether it's a couple of days face to face in a classroom and a couple of days at home on a computer via Google mm -hmm. Classroom, Zoom classes, stuff like that. I, I, I'm concerned that in for the upcoming, not the current, not the next fiscal year, but the one that we're planning for, um, that these families need the technological needs, hotspots, mm -hmm. Wi-Fi, more than one laptop or tablet in the house because there's multiple young people who need to be on classrooms. Um, I think that's a huge thing that they're going to need because I think we're moving towards that anyway. And I think the DOE is kind of showing their hand on it a little bit. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to speak um, to that. I don't know if any families have chimed in on it in any of your meetings yeah, that over the past yeah. couple of months. So um, I think we all saw the need for uh, broadband service when we all went remote. Um, what I wasn't aware and I'm willing to share with this committee is a reporter actually brought to my attention that a report was made by the Citizens Committee um, where they highlighted um, neighborhoods in New York City that um, what had, had the lowest broadband connectivity per household. And the Lower East Side was actually number one. Um, so it was a perfect storm of circumstances be being low income, not having um, a device, not having broadband or Wi-Fi, um, or maybe just having a household with just one phone with service doesn't mean that you know a whole family, if you have multiple kids, can work off of Google Classroom on your mobile device because that's not efficient either. Um, the only way Google, Google Classroom really, really works better is on a laptop because you can type better. Everything else, it, it's wonky. I've tried it on my phone. I've tried it on iPads. It's wonky. You can't download, you can't really upload uh, files. Sometimes you can't even print files properly. Um, so there is, I firmly do believe what I'm hearing. I know that the teachers union has a large voice in what the um, outcome of what September will look like. Um, but what I'm hearing on the ground is a couple of scenarios, one of them being a hybrid form where you will be in the classroom a couple of days in, of the week and then the rest will be remote. The other is like sh alternate shifts, you know, like a group of kids in the morning, a group of kids in the afternoon. Um, so I think this is a larger discussion. I don't know how, how you, far you wanna get into this, but <laughs> I just, cause right, we can't, we can't connect every single household with broadband service. But, you know, the fact that we're number one on a list in New York City, um, 
is sort of concerning for me as well because families, you know, what highlighted the need was when, you know, Spectrum and Optimum, you know, thought they were doing such a great honorable job of um, giving service to families, but yet the fine print said if you had bills prior to that were unpaid, they, they would refuse you service, which ultimately changed. But now service has only been extended to was 60 days and 60 days has already expired or is expiring for some families. And they're pushing to have DOE, uh, to be cert, these companies to push to June. But then what if we ha you have a child that has to go to summer school? What are you gonna do to August? There's no discussion about that. And then if we do go to a hybrid form, what, what is the rest of the year gonna look like? A lot of families were trying to find hotspots, you know, through the Link NYC. We don't really have any of those in the neighborhood, really, at least on the South End, where I am. Um, the New York City Public Library is closed. So unless you're going to pitch a seat in front of the building and do your work, that's not ideal <laughs> either. Um, so that's, I don't, I know there's organizations that if you do contact them and show the need, they will connect free Wi-Fi service for households or, you know, for like, they do like link type of things. Um, but that's going to require a larger push, especially if you're in a neighborhood that has the least broadband service per household in a city. So that is something to keep in mind, but I don't know how that's going to translate in your needs. I'm assessment. sorry. Oh, you, you said there was, we had the least broadband or the most? Oh. Least, least in the city per okay. household. Yeah, that, that makes sense to me. Uh, are you done? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. The first, uh, Alicia and then Deborah. Hi. Okay. Um, thank you so much for, for your comment and your input. Um, it's very helpful. I, I wanted to ask you if you've heard anything from the children that have um, autism. We have quite a few children in our district that are in um, these special programs like the NEST program. And um, many of the families are scrambling around looking for equipment for the children. Um, I have one young lady in particular that I've been trying to um, help get her some equipment because her son is mute. And mm. it has been very difficult for her to get resources during this COVID time. Um, she has nothing. I mean, every piece of equipment she's had to kind of buy herself one piece at a time. And he has to have special things in order for him to keep his mobility because right. he has a tendency to not be mobile. He'll shut down. Mm -hmm. And so um, I know that in the school in which I work, there quite a, like more than 50% of the school has children with autism or special needs. Um, so how does that help? How are parents getting help during this time? What resources do you think we should start to look at for like in situations like if this happens again, are there ways okay. that we can connect them faster to resources or is it something that you could suggest that the community board can write a resolution on to to help with I mean I don't I don't know what we could possibly do right I think look I think these were extraordinary circumstances like this has never happened in our lifetimes yeah. <laughs> there was you know people can say what they want but they I don't think anyone can account for having a pandemic and what that would look like no one did um, so I think, I think, I think it was, um, completely unexpected. Um, and from what I saw, DOE spent the whole time being reactive, then proactive. They were literally trying to figure things out as they went along. They were trying to figure things out. They didn't know where things were like it's, and it, it, you know, I don't think they did well. I mean, not that this is a shocker. They, no, they didn't plan well. And this is like, DOE, and I've said this to them in their face, they're not organizers. They're not organizers. They're, they just give you information, but they don't know if it's even needed. So I think, I think it was incredibly difficult. Sorry. I think it was, I think it was incredibly, incredibly difficult. Sorry about that, guys. Um, for, for them to assess. I think the challenge is, is um, they just resorted to, oh, everyone needs an 
an iPad, let's do that and request one, we'll send you one and then one and done. Um, my suggestion would be, I first want to connect with you offline, find out what she needs, how I can help her. I think if we're going to, I know this is going to be a hybrid moving forward. I think we can, we can collaborate on advocating for those families and making sure we find out what exactly they need. Um, because if you don't, if they don't know, they're not going to make it a priority. They're just not. And if you don't mention it to them, it, it never happened. Um, and certainly if you don't have it in writing, you can't prove that they knew. So I know there's a lot of needs out there, but the problem is, is um, as you well know, is parents don't know who to ask. So they might ask their teacher, their teacher then might ask, you know, the parent coordinator, then they might ask the principal. And depending on the involvement or the efficiency of these staff members, they might be able to help and sometimes they may not. And sometimes they'll say, well, I asked, I didn't hear back, I don't know what else to do. Um, you know, for all intents and purposes, there's a culture of, of, of saying, I tried, you know, no one's asking me, I don't know what to do and leaving it at that. So um, I think there's, it depends on the school community. There's some sort of school communities who had did an internal survey, they already knew the families that needed what they needed, the equipment, they, and they mobilized. A lot of the school communities use their PTAs to help pay for devices. Um, my son's middle school, um, for instance, their PTA donated money because for every family that got an iPad, they ordered a keyboard to go with the iPad. And you know, in a household with multiple kids, that may have to be on classes at the same time. They also gave every single child that needed it a headphone set. And these are all things that you don't realize you need until you're in it, until you go, oh, smokes. Like, I didn't realize I need a pair of headphones. Like, how are these kids gonna concentrate? How I'm gonna concentrate as an adult if you're still working and take your call? So it's one of those things that you don't know until you do know. And then if, once you do know, what do you do to get it done? So it depends on the school community. Every cer certain pe places are really organized and get it together. Some don't, um, not an excuse, but definitely sort of want to give you a, a, a lay of the land of how these, and oftentimes once parents hear, I don't know what to do. If they don't know that there's a CEC for them, or if, you know, there's a citywide, um, cool. There's a citywide council, just like CEC one. It's a citywide on special education and even District 79. They can use those people, but again, you don't know what you don't know. So um, that's been the challenge: is the whole time people are just being reactive, and it's you can never get ahead. You just can't because there's always more and more and more needs. But definitely, let's connect offline. See how I can help. Okay, and then maybe we can see how we can act, how we can how they should actually get ahead. Yeah. Um, Deborah. Deborah Glass. Yeah, I forgot. Um, so thank you, Naomi. That was really great. You actually answered most of the question that I had, but. Um, I guess just even anecdotally, how successful within CEC1 do you think um, the DOE got devices into the hands in our community? Um, Thank you. How successful? Do, I mean, in my, I, I have a very high threshold for success. <laughs> so I personally feel like devices should have been in families' hands within a week. But, you know, when you're ordering 300,000 and you need to coordinate families to get information to families, um, the rollout was very bumpy. Families didn't know they could request a device. Um, families didn't know they could request a device. And once they did, they didn't know how to do it. Then there was, there was some rumors that there was a cutoff date for devices and they didn't know what to do. And, you know, some households had devices, like for instance, my, you know, I didn't need a device because I was fortunate enough that I, I've had laptops for everyone. But then I, 
circumstances happen. I had a laptop that fell and the screen cracked, then what, you know? So um, there's, there was a lot, there was a lot of um, lack of information because again, they didn't know who to ask or the parent coordinator wasn't sharing the information or the information being shared wasn't right. Um, last I heard in, in district one, this was, I want to say about a week ago, we had, we had requests. Oh, I could just check my notes. because I, I don't like giving misinformation. Okay. So I just wanted to, um, Okay, so there's there's different kinds of questions going on here. So people are have a lot of questions about what went wrong this time and how they could have done better. But also committee members, let's think about, you know, just when, when we do, a, th all this translated into some kind of need. And I'm sure you all know what it is. Um, so if we can just uh, think more about that and not, not ask mm. questions about what went wrong this time, that would be good. And uh, Naomi, if you could um, address that. You know, so for example, you know, something needs well, to be done about the digital access for sure. Yeah, digital access, um, s assessing um, digital needs for families. I think that wasn't done properly. Mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of surprises um, addressing what type of devices already exist in the home and how many do they need. Families didn't know that they need to, if they have multiple kids in the household they needed to fill out the form multiple times they thought it was a one and done so if you have a kid you know four kids in the household you get one lap one ipad how is that going to work um and i also think um you know just little things like i mentioned before like not having a headphone you, you don't know you need it until four kids need to be on a zoom call at the same time with their classes and you're in a one-bedroom apartment i don't know how it's going to work um as a tally, just so you know, Deborah, I think last time I heard last week, we were down to the last hundred families didn't have an iPad. But again, we're almost at the end of May, you know, end of June rather, um, end of May. So that's still disheartening for me. But there's nothing, there's nothing we can really do about it. I think if anything, we we just learn. We can all learn from this of how we can reach our families better and and be more proactive than reactive. Okay. Okay. So I see Tatiana and Susan with their hands raised. Okay. I'll just take two more questions uh, for um, Naomi. First from Tatiana and then from Susan, and then we will move on to our next speaker, uh, Carlin. Tatiana. Tati. Hi, Naomi. Um, hey, so I guess my question, I know we don't know the future of after school programs really, but nonetheless, I know how important after school programs are for students in temporary housing. And so I'm just wondering, because I've, I've been doing some research about, you know, a need being to prioritize admissions for students in temporary housing and also um, for, um, and also because if you don't get into um, an after school program, the likelihood of getting into a summer school, a summer after school program or a summer uh, camp program is less likely. So I was just wondering if you had any information about that within our district and after schools for temp after school programming for temp for students in temporary housing within the district. Yeah, um, so we have uh, one school that always comes to mind because they have sort of been the standout example of what to do with families in temporary housing is PSMS 188. Um, they are one of the two um, along with PS15, they have the most families in temporary housing. That's literally because of locality. Families live across the street. Um, they are a complete wraparound service. They have washer and dryers there with detergent for families to wash their stuff. They have um, after school. They have um, extended hours on their after school. Sometimes it goes to eight, nine o'clock. Um, they serve hot dinners. And they also do um, weekends. Friday and Saturday uh, programming and the same thing in the summer. So when I think of an example of what it looks like, I think of them um, and cutting those services will directly impact these families, right? Because they rely on it. If, if you know anything about sort of the lifespan of, of being in a temporary housing facility, you're required to look for work 
you're required to go endless meetings and you have to drag your kids with these meetings, which means you're missing school. Um, and if you're working, that means you're working, depending on your work shift, you may be coming home late. And you, so you rely on these after school providers to help feed your children. Um, so that's sort of the first thing that I think of. Now talking about admissions, me and you can talk offline because CEC one has, I can share all that details with you. We, we, although we don't get any shine about it, we didn't get any fancy press conference. We were the first in New York city to, uh, have the first admissions policy and it includes a threshold of including, um, students in temporary housing across every single school, but we can talk offline about that. Okay, great. Uh, Susan. Okay, thank you. Um, can you in the next few days send me your top five capital priorities that you believe are not funded so we can put them on our agenda for our meeting with DOE? Absolutely. Thank you. Yep. Okay, Thomas, you got that? <laughs> All right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you, Naomi. So, Naomi, you're welcome to stay. Uh, we're going to have Carlin yeah, speak next. Okay, great. Carlin? Hi, everyone. My name is Carlin Cowan with uh, the Chinese American Planning Council. My pronouns are they, them, or she, her. Thank you so much for having me join you tonight. It's really a pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, so at CPC, we worked with um, about 30 other organizations that are working in Asian American neighborhoods, um, including, as May said, 11 um, in CB3's area to come up with what we call the Asian American Neighborhood Recovery Plan. Um, and I think that what's important here is to note that we're talking about um, neighborhoods rather than necessarily Asian Americans as a um, racial and ethnic group across the state overall. And the reason for that is kind of recognizing, number one, the diversity that exists within areas like Chinatown and the Lower East Side, um, but to also recognize that a lot of the impact that we saw was really geographic. And the reason we thought it was important to put this together was because we have obviously seen a lot of impacts, um, particularly economic ones due to COVID-19 in neighborhoods with high levels of Asian American populations um, because of a lot of the anti-Asian discrimination surrounding COVID-19. So we know that, you know, in lower Manhattan and in Chinatown that as early as February, there were reports of our small businesses and restaurants having loss of 50% um, in revenue before, you know, and this is a month before New York ever went on pause and we saw uh, this become a widespread phenomenon. So we joined together to put together this recovery plan, recognizing that the impact in these geographic areas that have um, large Asian American populations was going to be different than that facing New York City as a whole. Um, we do plan to kind of continue refining this plan as we see what the ongoing impact of COVID-19 and the economic impacts are, but we also wanted to put together a first draft of it or a first go at it early on because we knew that a lot of decision makers at the city level were going to be, you know, beginning to make decisions about this year's budget and then even looking forward. So for, for us in the first round of this plan that we sent out to all of our elected officials, um, we focus on several main areas for recovery. And in our minds, it's really important that these areas be addressed in conjunction with each other, recognizing that you know we have multi-generational families in our neighborhoods. We have um, residential and commercial that there are um, just lots of different areas where communities and community members need support. Um, so I'll quickly overview the, the main areas that we recommended, but then I'm certainly happy to do a deeper dive into any of them, depending on where your questions are. Um, one of our main areas was workers and economic security. Again, addressing the idea that we saw large job loss in Asian American neighborhoods and large impact on those businesses. Um, as early as January. And so um, 
For us, that looks like really two major things, um, providing relief for all of the workers that have had wage loss and replacement, and particularly at the city level, pushing for that relief to include community members that have been left out of federal relief, um, particularly for a lot of immigrant workers, um, workers in cash jobs, so some delivery workers and other part-time and informal economy workers, we've seen that the federal relief has not really been um, reaching them. And so making sure that that is something that the city prioritizes. And then- I'm sorry, Carlin, I just want to interrupt you for a minute. Um, did the committee members, did you receive this last minute email I sent you maybe a half an hour before the meeting and has an attachment with that plan? Yes, no? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, you, you can read along on that if you wish. Go ahead, Marlon. Um, um, and then moving forward, and, and Naomi did touch on some of these things, um, investing in workforce training and placement to ensure that in long-term economic recovery, that there are options available to folks. We don't know what the economic recovery is going to look like, and so city programs that support our young people like the Summer Youth Employment Program, our Adult Literacy Programs, our Workforce Training and Placement Programs, um, and then bridge programs that serve um, immigrant community members and other city programs like that, we think is a really high priority so that we ensure that um, community members are able to move through this long term in a significant way. Um, and of course, the concern there is that at the city level, we have seen cuts to those programs when what we really would like to see is an investment or an enhancement in those instead. Um, and of course, that is, you know, again, something that Naomi touched on, but something that we're going to see as kind of a common pattern um, throughout this. Obviously, going along with the support for individual workers is the small businesses. We know that the extra month or six weeks of that economic impact in, um, in lower Manhattan and other Asian American neighborhoods means that small businesses in those neighborhoods are facing an even bigger deficit than they are facing New York wide because you're talking an additional month of rent, an additional month of utilities and other leases um, labor costs where a loss of revenue was already experienced. And so um, something that we're again there pushing for at the city level is to designate neighborhoods like um, Chinatown and the Lower East Side as an economic distress zone. Um, we've seen that happen before with disasters like 9-11 and with Hurricane Sandy. Um, and then providing relief in the form of abatements as well as providing grants for reopening. Um, we also know that housing and neighborhood affordability will be a big issue um, because of that interrelated economic impact. And one of the things that we really don't want to see is a, that this crisis becomes something that changes our, our housing or our neighborhood makeup in a significant way because of the impact on people. Um, so thinking through number one, how do we support individual tenants? Um, how do we support NYCHA community members? We know that with the income recertification, there have been a lot of issues for folks living in NYCHA facilities that are technically eligible for relief but are not getting it. Um, and then providing um, subsidies for commercial tenants that can't afford rent, um, particularly in mixed use and supportive housing buildings. And then another big area for us is, is public health and health care. I'll be really brief here because um, this is something that we obviously see an impact on across the board, but in the immediate term, pushing for free testing and treatment, um, the contact tracing program at the city level, we think it's very important that that be culturally and linguistically appropriate so that our neighborhoods are really able to um, participate in and feel safe participating in that program. And then what does it look like at the city to provide comprehensive health care and mental health support, um, particularly for essential workers who are facing trauma, um, Asian Americans who are facing trauma related to stigma and discrimination, 
Um, and then of course, supporting our public hospitals, something that we've been extremely concerned to see is the cuts that happened at the state level to Medicaid, which of course impact our public hospital systems um, that supply a lot of the lower Manhattan neighborhood residents with healthcare services. And so seeing that increased investment in the public hospital programming. Um, this was already mentioned really briefly, but, um, or I'll go over it really briefly because it was already mentioned, digital language access. We have seen issues with digital access um, with everything from our young people, which Naomi addressed, to actually seniors really struggling with digital access and being unable to get accurate information because of lack of broadband, because of lack of devices. And so addressing digital equity moving forward is something that is you know, not only important, but is highly achievable at the city level um, as we think through what education, work, and access to information look like. And then of course, language access with that, we saw with a lot of our young people doing remote learning, who either English is a second language for them or for their parents, having that additional barrier on top of what other students are already facing um, of not being able to have their parents support them through homework or not being able to navigate instruction um, in the language that they speak at home. And then kind of undergirding all of this is supporting the community-based neighbor neighborhood organizations. So settlement houses, social services agencies um, that are doing this work. Um, you know, we all believe as those community-based organizations that because we have that deep knowledge in the neighborhoods that we are going to be central to the recovery. I think an example of this that we saw is with the meal delivery programs um, where the city went to try to kind of take over those programs and do delivery coordinated through the city, that there ended up being a lot of issues, not only identifying seniors who were homebound and needed meals, but ensuring that those meals were then going to be culturally competent, um, nutritionally appropriate, and more. And so um, for us, seeing those community-based organizations and social services at the center of recovery, we think is going to be really important. Um, across the city budget in this year, we've certainly seen cuts to kind of all of those social services programming that really undergirds this whole recovery plan. Um, DIFTA has seen an 11% cut at a time that we know that our seniors need support to remain in their homes safely and comfortably more than ever. Uh, DYCD, we have a 39% cut that's largely due to youth programming. We think that now is a time more than ever that young people actually need this programming support, whether it is after school like the Beacons and Compass or uh, youth employment programming like SYEP. Um, and then similarly, DOHMH, we saw a, an 8% cut and uh, Department of Social Services about the same. And so um, something that we're really pushing for is as we move into FY. 21, 22, as well as beyond, really focusing on building out social services because we have seen a huge spike in the demand for social services. And if the funding is not there at the city level to meet that demand, um, then it's really going to slow our recovery process. So I'll pause there um, and I'm happy to go into any of this further to whatever extent it is helpful to um, the really important work that you're all doing, and uh, I really appreciate the efforts that, that you're making. Okay, I just wanted to uh, note uh, for those of you who are not on the committee and did not receive the email, uh, I sent a link in the chat box. Um, it's like, um, what is it? It says something about uh, community-based organizations release Asian American, blah, blah, blah. Uh, click on the link, and that's the report that uh, Carlin is reading off of. And then later on, um, Naomi sent a link about the digital divide report. Okay, questions for uh, Carlin? Wait, um, questions for Carlin. Please raise your hand. Oh, Thomas. It's Thomas and then Susan. Hey, Carlin, um, call me a dreamer, but is there any um, possibility of investment from, from private um, 
corporations, such as some of these people with the, the luxury buildings and the neighborhoods. And I mean, has there been any success or attempt to get some private funding? I think that that is certainly something that we have to look towards in terms of, um, you know, not, not just relying on government support, but really kind of diversifying tactics. Um, one of our recommendations was um, actually looking at land trusts because obviously what we don't want is um, for kind of any um, private support or investment to fundamentally change the character of the communities um, or, or have harmful impacts on the communities. Um, but I think that that's something that we really have to look towards. Uh, typically, what we've seen is that, you know, private investment dollars don't tend to go into um, Asian American and communities of color um, as much. But I think that that is actually all the reason to push for it more at this time. So I think that that's, that's certainly something that we really need to focus on in addition to thinking through what the government's role in, in all of this is. Okay, Susan? It was an overwhelming amount of information. And um, a lot of things you talked about are things we um, are also discussing in other committees. For instance, land trust is very important in our housing. Um, last night we talked about um, even particularly the uh, small business needs in Chinatown. Um, so. It, it's covering, your report is covering a lot of ground. For this committee, for our social service organizations, um, are there some, and I, you know, I haven't looked in your report, so I don't know if it's in the report, are there some few top priorities that we can focus on that everybody is um, agreed on? And the reason I ask that, like with SYEP, we wrote what we wrote a letter protesting because everybody focused on SYEP and we may looks like we may have a little bit of success. So are there a few areas um, for our social services that we can focus on? Absolutely. Um, and I think that that is such a great question. So thank you. Um, I think for, for us, it's a couple of things. Um, number one would be SYEP and other youth programming. Um, you know, we know that this summer is going to look different than other summers. That's just a reality of the situation that we're in. That does not mean that we should not be providing young people with high quality programming for the summer and into the school year. Um, number one, for our younger um, for our younger people, it's going to be really necessary to allow their parents to work and get back to work. And then for our older youth, the high school age ones, we know that that is really critical programming, particularly at a time when their academic experience is interrupted. Um, and as they're starting to think about moving into college or jobs or whatever is coming for them afterwards. And then of course we know that it's critical income for them and their families as well. And so I think that preserving and protecting that funding um, in FY. 21 is really key. Um, if we don't really fight to restore that programming, I think that we'll find that the infrastructure, the staff, the spaces um, will go away because some of the organizations won't be able to sustain it. And so I think that, you know, that is one critical area, the SYEPs, the beacons, the compasses, um, all of those. A second one for me is senior services. Um, you know, our, our seniors are going to need ongoing support through the recovery of this. We don't know how long it's going to be until they can um, safely go back out. A lot of our seniors are already homebound anyway. And so those supportive services look like everything from meal services to um, support for getting medications, mental health services to combat isolation, the geriatric mental health initiative, um, is just one example of that, but then also health initiatives that come out of the Department of Health. Um, and then digital access because we're seeing, and you know, obviously that digital access goes for our young people too, but we're seeing a real, um, a real cutoff between our seniors and information and relationships um, because of the lack of digital access. And that's something that, you know, 
for fairly low dollar investments, you could really increase digital access um, for our seniors for kind of the duration of this crisis and recovery. And then I think that the last one is um, the social services budget in terms of benefits, enrollment, and navigation. We're seeing a huge spike in community members that um, either have not been a part of public benefits before that are now needing SNAP or needing Medicaid, um, need to add, navigate unemployment and um, other changes at the federal level. And so not only making sure that those public benefit programs are fully funded through HRA, but that the navigation exists so that community members that might be limited English proficient um, might lack digital access themselves and otherwise are really able to connect with them. And I think particularly as we move into the contact tracing and testing phase, um, which is likely to, to go on for some time in New York, um, according to the estimates that, that most public health experts are saying, um, making sure that those navigation services remain um, throughout. Thank you. Um, if I could just ask follow up, um, some of these things are morbid. Do you have any idea, like particularly like with the number of seniors that we've lost, is anyone, you know, are there statistics by neighborhood um, or, you know, that we could look at locally um, and particularly to see where this happened because um, this kind of points to looking at the inequality in our neighborhoods? Um, I missed the very first part of that question. I'm sorry, I only caught the last. So in looking at people that either got sick during the pandemic or that died, are we yeah. tracking that in a way that we can look at who they are and where they are so that we can look at this for planning for um, equity in all areas in the future? Yeah, that's a very important thing to do. And that's actually been one of um, our major concerns is that right now the reporting is actually really based on um, hospital data only. And so the, the flaws in that are two things. Number one, it doesn't necessarily um, give us a comprehensive look at where people live when they've either gotten sick or died due to COVID. And it only covers those deaths that are, um, those, those sicknesses or deaths that are reported in the hospitals. So places that we're missing are nursing homes, um, people who die at home, people who are in home care. And the fear is that it's really giving us an inaccurate picture of what the, the actual situation was as well as what the impact was. Um, CPC is working with um, the Commission on Public Health System, New York Immigration Coalition, and some other organizations um, on a campaign that's pushing for better data to be included on that. Um, of course, the, you know, in a lot of ways, we're worried that early data was never collected, and so we've missed that opportunity. But I think particularly as we move into the next phase, um, making sure that those systems are in place to do exactly what you talked about, and then trying the best we can to actually gather data from other sources as much as it exists. Hey, thank you. Um, Carlin, wasn't there a problem that the data was not aggregated enough? That's been also a huge problem. So for, um, for folks that saw the data coming out of the Department of Health, it was really, um, you know, it took a while for them, first of all, to release the disaggregated data by race. And then what we saw there is that actually the largest reported category was other. Um, and so what that says is that either people aren't collecting race data and it's going into other, or because the race data was really just split into white, black, Latinx, and Asian and didn't break out by a uh, racial and ethnic subgroup. Um, that when there was the opportunity to either self-report data or data was being collected from certain places, that it wasn't being properly categorized. Um, you know, I think that we all know anecdotally and by the data that um, communities of color are being hit harder by COVID-19 than 
um, white folks. And we know that based on not only the COVID data, but just the inequalities that have already existed in our healthcare system. Um, but that data is very concerning because it doesn't give us a whole picture. Um, so we've been really pushing for future data collection to disaggregate data into um, further racial and ethnic subgroups um, following the, the city outline of the 38 racial and ethnic subgroups that they have collected city health data in before. Um, and then other things is that, you know, there should be other data indicators collected as well. So talking about things like gender identity, LGBTQ status, um, socioeconomic status, immigrant status, uh, that obviously has its own complications involved. Um, but what does it look like to actually collect better data so we really have a sense of um, where and who and how people are being impacted by this? And that is going to be really critical, um, again, as we move through through recovery over the next several years. OK, um, thank you. Paul, did you have a question? Your hand was up and down. I had a wonderful monologue prepared about statistics. And then Susan went and asked the question. So OK, that's, that's good. All right, good. OK, are there any other questions? Okay, great. Um, I just wanted to recognize that Aura from Harvey Epstein's office has joined us. Thank you for coming. Um, okay. Thomas? No? I was just saying hi to Aura. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, okay, so what are our... Okay, so we have all this information now. Let's talk about what our next steps should be. Right now, it's about 7:51. We have you know, we we have the reports, we have the information. Um, we can start writing some of it. We still need to invite other speakers to give us more information. What speakers would that be? In what areas? So we have in our district need statement, we have, um, oh, let me let this person in. Oh, we have health and human services. I mean, I'm sorry, we have seniors. Uh, we had um, youth. There was a section on education, uh, various sections on homeless. And then there was a section on health. So it's kind of a mixture of both um, populations and areas. Um, could could we ask someone to um, come, and I don't know if it would be from an agency or a nonprofit, um, about the future of shelters for homeless, because it seems that congregate um, shelters that we have had in the past are not going to work for the future. Um, would that be an area that people might be interested in? I, I would think so. I mean, I don't know what they're going to do. Oh, Deborah yes. has her. I agree. Heidi, did you have any ideas about this? And Deborah seems to have a thumb up. I'm not sure what that means. I don't have any ideas about it, but I, I guess just to say that I do think that we should have an advocate speak rather than someone from DHS speak on that. You know, I think one of the big sticking points of the the governor being so hesitant to actually move people into individual uh, rooms in hotels is because how do you get them out then after quote, you know, quote unquote, after the pandemic. Um, and so I think, yeah, we should have someone come from the advocacy community rather than DHS. Do you have a, a, a suggestion? Um, I can look, there's a few people on, organizations that are talking about this a lot on Twitter, um, but I can look at them and I don't particularly know anyone at the one who's really doing this, but I can think about it and get back to you. Who's really doing this? I mean, There's like, one called how, it's like housing safety net, something like that. Know. You know, before all this happened, remember we wanted someone to talk, come talk to us about street homeless 
I forgot what the issue was exactly. And we contacted um, Coalition for the Homeless and then they uh, recommended community access. So at the time they were supposed to come to us in April. Of course, we never had the April meeting, but do you think mm -hmm. we can go back to them? The one that I'm looking at is called um, Safety Net Project of the Urban Justice Center. So it's like a piece, an arm of the Urban Justice Center who's really been advocating on this. There's also a doctor who's really involved in this. Her name's Kelly Doran. Doran. Yeah, from community access, um, that's more developmental. Um, Carla, who is the person who is coming to us, has worked with us in, actually in transportation because of a number of issues that they advocated for. Um, I don't know for an overall thing whether they would be the best for this, but we can try some of these other places. Okay, I wanted to remind people about the chat box. If you have a question for everyone, please just raise your hand and say it. Do not put it in the chat box. The chat box is only for um, attendance of non-committee members. And also if you're having technical difficulties, you can, um, Larissa will help you out if you're having technical difficulties. My bad, I actually put it in the chat when you said what was the thumbs up for. So the thumbs up is in the chat. It was to what Susan said about inviting someone and as a co-signing on what was just said about having an advocate as well. Okay, great. Did you have a specific question about it or you just uh, agreed? No, you asked a question, so. Okay. So let me say that um, Heidi and I will together figure out who to invite and have someone come for the next, uh, for the next meeting on that. Is that okay? Okay, Heidi's gonna figure out and invite somebody? Well, the two of us together. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so that'll be another to do. Susan and Heidi are going to figure it out and invite somebody to come to the July meeting. Okay, so that's for the uh, specifically around, well, one of the main, well, a pressing question is, what are we gonna do about these congregate shelters and settings? Yeah. And you know maybe the future of sheltering in CB3. I just kind of would like to announce to everyone. Um, this is not announced broadly, but we got notice. We now have two hotels um, with single men being run by BRC in order to um, have less density in the shelters. So it's an increase in the number of buildings, but the number of people being housed is the same. Right. Okay. Right. And actually, these are people that were not in CB3 before. So our population in CB3 is actually increasing. Okay. All right. Um, Deborah? Susan, do you know um, where in CB3 these hotels are? I do, but I don't have it on um, me. One's on the Bowery, one's on Henry Street. Could you repeat that? One's on the Bowery and one's on Henry Street. Thank you. Okay. So what area, what other areas should we... Um... Hey, Carmen, seniors. What about seniors? what I was just thinking. Carmen? Oh. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, so far, um, from what I've known in the area, um, the local um, mutual housing association, we've lost four. So that's been kind of hard to deal with in the meantime. Um, and as far as the other programs, um, they were switched over to just uh, food preparation and delivery. Um, I, I don't know of anything else happening right now, except for maybe a few virtual classes that offer perhaps yoga um, and a couple of uh, other light exercises. I know that our office will offer on June the 17th, uh, a, um, uh, um, what is it, a, uh, a workshop 
as it were, on um, with volunteers of legal services on the uh, documents. Because um, with one of my other senior clients, um, we lost him, but uh, there's really nothing we can do at the moment about that. There was no one else that we can call about that. Um, but as far as I'm hearing from my other colleagues, um, I know that uh, DIPTA has distributed um, mask for us to now give to the seniors. We had one shipment uh, three weeks ago, and we had another shipment this week. Okay, so Carmen, I was actually we were asking um, for July. Do you think we could invite somebody who can talk to us about what the uh, long-term needs of the seniors are for 21-22, or is this what the asks so. are? And mm -hmm. then after that, we'll go to Troy because he has his hand up. All right. Uh, I can speak to someone at the um, Lower East Side Interagency Council to come and speak about that. Would that be appropriate? Sure. Um, you can uh, maybe give us their name or you know, CC me and Susan. Absolutely. Is that Susan? Is that the way to go? Oh, Susan has um, her hand raised. That, that would be fine. I wanted to also suggest, along with that, uh, there is no one that knows this better and fights harder than Margaret. Um, hey. If you want to have her come. Oh, that would be good too. Yeah, she was just talking to us this morning. Okay, someone from Margaret's office. Okay. Or Margaret. Okay. Uh, okay. So who wants to con Susan, do you want me to contact them or are you going to talk sure, to them anyway? I don't care. One of us, whichever you prefer. Okay, I'll do it. I know you're busy. I'll, I'll send an Thanks. email and I'll CC you. Super. Okay, Troy. Uh, yes, I, I just want to know if uh, you guys are inviting anybody for youth services. I know we spoke about schooling. We spoke about after schools, uh, but how about something for youth services, some programming for the youth after schools, like, you know, that's not involving an extra two or three hours after school, like a whole program. The Low East Side is lacking programming. The boys clubs have closed down down here, uh, and there's really nothing for these kids to do but be out on the streets, six, seven, eight o'clock at night. Hello? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yes, thank you. Okay, what does anyone? Henry Street, you want to ask Henry Street? Would that be good or no? Uh, it, it sounds like a good idea. Does any, anyone, shall we invite Henry? I'm no, sorry, would... Henry, Henry Street would be great, right? But there, there's some um, other nonprofits here that don't have space in the area that probably have good ideas also. Yeah, so, so when we invite a speaker, it's not just for them to talk about their own organization, but to talk about the needs overall. Okay. So, so if they can also speak to the smaller organizations, or gen it's actually it's not even about the organization, about what the needs for the youth are. So you can say, you know, for example, you know, more than ever, you know, youth are going to need the summer programming and the social emotional support because of all these things are, that are happening um, in order for them to, you know, just, you know, thrive and survive into the next few years. So that, that's what we want them to talk about. And if, so, if I could just add, it is focused only on CB3. They may be someplace else, but we want to talk about programs in CB3 where we need them, where we're losing them, where we need to expand. Yes. Yes, yeah, so that we do need the specifics. Hey, it's Aura. Um, can I ask a question or make a comment? Sure. What, what about like someone from um, DYCD? Uh, we're, we're doing our local nonprofits. Okay. Yeah, so, so Aura, the thing is that we want to hear from the ground like what 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 is it that we should be putting into our district needs? Yeah, the um, Education so, Alliance is also closing all their programming, so that's another loss that we're gonna have. We'll meet think, with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I mean, uh, 
I was going to say we meet with the agencies in September, so we already have a meeting set up with DYCD. Right, but Aura mentioned the Educational Alliance as another agency that's going to have to cut a lot of youth programming. Um, and today we had, you know, CPC, which is more a little bit more the Chinatown side. So the next two we should have are is the um, is a little bit more of the Lower East Side side. You want to ask Alan from the Educational Alliance or ask him to send someone from his youth services? Well, they're or closing sure. down all of their youth services. So I I'm know, but we're talking yeah. about our need. We're talking about our, our needs for July 2021 and to July 2022. Yeah, maybe it would be appropriate for them to come because that way they can say how many students they're no longer going to service. Well, are they planning to, 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 if they get resources, are they planning to, um, they're shutting you down. Know, ram oh, they're just shutting down. They just decided to shut down period. Yeah. They were oh. losing money from before and now it's just, they've decided to shut down completely. So they're going to partner with Grand Street or Henry Street and give them the names. I don't know how that's going to work out, but it would, it might be good to hear from them. Yeah. But isn't that an educational program? For early it's childcare. an after school program. After school yeah, for, and summer program. Okay, hey, but from, from my understanding, Educational Alliance goes from five to what age? I, I do actually know? don't know. I know that's okay. after school and summer. Yeah, okay, we're, when we're, we're talking about youth, we're talking about, you know, up to whatever you like to say, up to from zero to 18 or 21 18. or whatever okay yeah. whatever the age you consider it to be but it starts from zero so it does start from you know uh the, you know little kids uh, after I, I they're just, born I, I just thought educational alliances was more um geared towards the daycare that's all well they do have care you know um yeah. serious program yeah so why don't we um since let's since Henry Street and Grand Street are going to be running the programs. Let's invite them. And if uh, we can maybe talk to them if they feel it's appropriate to also invite Educational Alliance. Because if you say that um, they're going to take on their programs, then we might as well, do. well, my feeling is that we can just invite Henry and or Grand Street. Well, let me find well, out. Susan, what do you think? You know, I, I don't I was going to say, let's find, out, let's find out for sure who's going to be running the program. I mean, who's going to be taking, I'll find out from Henry street if they're yeah. going to be taking them. I think they certainly probably have most programs. Um, I don't know if grant street, I know has, um, some cornerstone programs. I don't know what other, which other youth programs they have. Does anyone know what, what do they have besides cornerstone? Hey, Paul, did you have an answer to that or you wanted to talk about something else? I was going to go in a different direction, not to answer Susan's question. Okay, so I don't know that Grand Street has as many other than the Cornerstone youth programs. Let me, let's find out and we'll have, you know, one of our big local nonprofits come. Oh, okay. Oh, could you talk to them then? Sure. Okay. Uh, Paul. I was just going to simply add that maybe you want to ask University Settlement as well, because they may be one of the agencies that take on some of those young people that are leaving the other uh, educational alliance. Oh, and you work at the door. Well, so the door's not part of CB3, so I'm, I don't want to offer any opinion on that. We, uh, we can, University, University Settlement is in CB3, the door is not. We, we can do that. It's just you should figure out how many people you want and which are the top people that you want. Which are, how many nonprofits you want on this issue and what are the top ones and I'll contact them. Okay, so we said Grand Street, Henry Street, University Settlement. You, okay, do you want three people, you want three organizations to come? I think it's okay if they can uh, speak together. Okay. Do you think that they have that? Like, a, you know, sort of a uniform voice? Yeah. Or they, okay, if they can do that, that would be great. And whoever's available, I mean, you know, at least one, at least one of them. If it's just one, then it's one. If it's all three, it's all three. Okay. You have to have all three. Okay. 
So, so now, so just to review, um, next we uh, we're, we're inviting someone for youth, um, seniors, and the uh, uh, homeless po population. Right. Okay. Anything else on this? Okay. If we have nothing else on on the district needs, then it's eight oh nine. We are going to move on to. CAB reports. Did anyone go to any of you cab reps? Did you go to a meeting? Yep, I did. You actually did? Okay. <laughs> well, we went to a virtual meeting. Uh, we had it over the phone for Gouverneur. Um, they now are offering um, no waiting on the testing for COVID-19 and also antibody testing. Really? So you do not have to make an appointment. You can just go and show up. Wow. Yeah. Can I ask a question on that? Sure. Um, for the antibody testing, is this um, from the city and it's from that Roche, R-O-C-H-G? Yes. Super. Okay. Any others? Bellevue, Mount Sinai, Beth Israel. Shirley, was the, did Beth Israel have a meeting? Oh, I don't know. Oh, uh, she. Okay, I, she doesn't seem to be able to unmute herself. Okay. So, um, oh, hey, um, we haven't had any Beth Israel meetings. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. All right. Um, any other, any other meetings besides the hospitals? Or Susan, the homeless shelter, the shelters haven't had any, is that correct? Um, nothing official. It turns out um, that Smith Houses called a meeting that included um, uh, Catherine Street Shelter and she had people from DHS and everyone there except the community board. So um, that was just something I found out about. Okay. Okay, all right. Okay, good. Or okay, not. So. So communications is lacking. I, I don't think it was lack of communication. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Um, hey, Paul, what's the next, I mean, Thomas, what's the next agenda item? Thomas? You have to unmute. Your, oh. Yeah, I'm looking, I'm looking. Is it just a vote, the last vote? Yeah, it says vote to adjourn. Okay. All right. Okay. So this is where we're coming to the end of our meeting. Um, I see someone named Caroline. Who's Caroline? I don't. Okay. It's sorry. I was on mute. It's Caroline from Senator Brad Hoylman's office. Hello, Caroline. Hi, how's it going? Okay, well, yeah, we're at the end of our meeting. Was there something you wanted to announce to us or address us on? I, I just wanted to listen. Okay, great. Well, it's thank good you. to have you here. Thank you, thank you for having me. Okay. All right, so we're on the last, uh, we're, okay, this is the final um, agenda item. We are voting to adjourn. Thomas is going to take uh, a roll call vote. Okay, um, starting with me. Yes. Deborah. Yes. Larissa. Yes. You got me right, yes? Well, he's, um, 
Oh, maybe he's having you know, oh, technical he's problems. I thought it was me. Yeah, he's second. frozen. <laughs> <laughs> what do we do? He's frozen, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Is that us or is it him? It's him. It's him, yeah. Maybe we can put... Oh, you know, he's, a, he's on screensaver probably. Oh, Thomas. Thomas. Oh, he's unmuted, so he's, I think he's frozen. Okay, so we said... Yeah, we lost him. Okay, okay so it was May. Okay, May says yes. Um, Larissa is yes. Okay, Thomas. Oh, let me just look at the thing. Uh, Paul? Yes. Carmen? Yes. Okay, Deborah said yes, right? Um, Heidi? Yes. Heidi, are you there? I see yeah. a little. Um, we've got Heidi. Okay. Yes, I'm here. Yes. yes. Shirley? Yes. Uh, David Crane? Oh, who else is there? Um, Tatiana? Yes. Hold on. Is there anyone else that I'm missing that I haven't, who's here, whose name I have not called? Okay, and uh, oh yes, Thomas is, we'll say he's here. All right then, well, let me just look at this. Oh, yes. Okay. Do we have any new business, old business? May, did you want me to say anything about Tuesday? Yes. The, 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 this is the time. Okay. Yeah, actually, uh, I should have done it before the vote, but um, we can still talk, do it now. It's not, not a problem. I, I know a lot of people have been asking about the incident that took place on Avenue D in early May. That will be addressed in a review on a transportation public safety on Tuesday, this Tuesday in the 9th at 630 on Zoom. So um, if you have questions about that incident, that specific incident and that review, we will be doing that this Tuesday on the agenda. Thank you. Yeah, so if you, yeah, so, so generally I encourage all committee members to look at the agenda items each month. And if there's something you're interested in to go to the committee meetings, it's a little easier now because you don't have to leave your house, uh, but you do have to get on the Zoom. So um, it's, uh, it's where a lot of the work is done and a lot of the information is given out. Uh, so, and then you can also, you know, most times, you know, participate in the discussion as well. So I really encourage you to look at the, um, the agenda, the other meeting items and please go to the meetings if you're interested. Are there any other announcements or new news or old news? Okay, wonderful. Okay, so this meeting is adjourned. And uh, you will be getting minutes uh, from us in about a week. Okay, so. Thanks, guys. Stay safe. Thank you. Okay, see you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. You too.